all these, the various gifts and ministries, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. For just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one Spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more pre presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do we all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. You'll see that I've titled the sermon this morning, God is Building His Church. I thought it's fitting here to bring in this perspective because what Paul is trying to communicate to the Corinthian church here is that God is building his church and he's warning them that they are at odds with the purposes of God. They're at odds with his purposes because of their fighting with one another. I'm of Paul. I am of Cephas. I have these spiritual gifts. I'm spiritual in this way. And so when they fight and bicker in this way, we've seen also the spiritual state in which the church is in. In chapter 5, we see that they have uh, immoral people in their church who go by unnoticed. And church discipline is left and not uh, executed so that the church is filled with people who hate God and hate his gospel and harden in their sin while they go about thinking, well, we are part and members of the body of Christ. But then also the members of the body of Christ are fighting with one another. They're in danger of leaving the gospel, just like the Galatian church was in danger of following a different gospel, a different Lord. It seems like wherever Paul is going, he has to remind people of the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. And we see this is the only thing that produces obedience in the Christian. This is the only thing that produces joy is this gospel that's preached, this truth that is held up, because it is only by this truth held up by the apostles, by pastors, by preachers, by elders, that is used mightily by the Holy Spirit to confirm the truths of the gospel in the heart of God's people. For the Holy Spirit will not confirm anything else except the truth and the true gospel in the heart of his people. The Holy Spirit will not convince you, in other words, of a false gospel. If you're convinced of a false gospel or another gospel, it is someone else leading you away. We've read this morning in John 10, we saw that Jesus said, the shepherd or the, the one going in by the door to go fetch the sheep, he is the shepherd, the one climbing over the fence, he is the thief. 
And then Jesus says this, I am the door. So in this scenario, Jesus is not the shepherd, but he's saying, I'm the door. Your shepherds go in and out of Christ. What would that look like practically for a pastor? What that would look like is early on a Sunday morning, I would get up and go sit in my office and finish some of the last works, but mainly to pray. Mainly to pray, Lord, bless the labor of the week where I've looked at various scriptures and sought to bring it in a logical way to your people, that they may see the clarity of your word, that they may see certain things from your word and from your scripture, and so bind them to Christ. Because I desire that my soul not be bound to anything else except for Jesus Christ. That's what it would look like, practically speaking, to come into the sheepfold by Christ, a pastor who prays that the Lord may help him to lead and to shepherd the flock, but then also to open his eyes that he may see, that he may see what the sheep needs, where he needs to say, no, not that way, this way. Even when the sheep get offended, no, I want to go this way. Have you ever seen a pastor trying to lead a sheep, a shepherd trying to lead a sheep who wants to go that way? Have you ever seen the nature of sheep that they always want to go the wrong way? Right? I lived on a farm. When we were to drive with the bucky, there's this big field where the sheep is, and the path would be close to the, to the, uh, um, to the fence, and the sheep would run all the way from there to the fence across the street because they see the bucky coming. And so they would behave in this bizarre way. You just want them to stay in the field. Stay where you are. But they go the wrong way. Anyway, so getting back to this, the shepherd praying to be in Christ, that when he approached the sheep, he may approach them in the shepherd, in the true and good shepherd, which Jesus also says in John 10, I am the good shepherd. The only way in which a shepherd is able to shepherd is when he shepherds under Christ. When he shepherds according to the word of Christ. And this is what Paul is trying to do here for the Corinthian church. Trying to shepherd them and show them. You are not just sheep for the sake of being sheep by yourself. You are sheep for the glory of the shepherd. For Christ Jesus who leads you. And so each sheep is not able to just go off on his own. Each member of the church, of the church each member of the body is not just to live for themselves. Notice, if you will, in this passage, Paul says again and again here who is ruling over the church. He says again and again who, to put it in our terms, is in charge. Verse 11 says, the Holy Spirit apportions as he wills. Verse 18 says, God arranged the members in the body, each of them as he chose. God arranged and he chooses. Verse 24, God has also composed, has so composed the body. God has composed the body. Verse 28, God has appointed in the church. Dear brother and sister, who is it that runs the church? Who is it that organizes the church? Who is it that decides what we must be busy with? Who is it that said preaching is the way that we must go? Who gives us permission if we were to say, no, we don't want preaching anymore. We want a band to come and perform for us. No, we don't want preaching. We want a worship band. Do we have permission to do that? Do we have permission to do anything other than Christ had ordered us to do in his word? Why don't we have permission to do anything else? We don't have permission because it won't be to our benefit. It won't be for the good of the sheep. You see, sheep love the shepherd. If you read Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. We all understand the beauty of that picture. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. We're content with being sheep. You see, what is this world teaching us? That this whole COVID pandemic, what's the thing that everyone, the phrase that everyone scolds everyone else by, if you just follow rules and so, you're a sheep, right? And then there are some people who go and say, well, yes, bah, I'm a sheep. Well, we are sheep, bah, I'm a sheep, but not just any sheep. Look at my ear, look at the mark that's there. Look who put his mark on me. 
I'm marked by Jesus Christ. I'm not a shepherdless sheep. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He will lead me. He will guide me. He will lead me in paths of righteousness. Even though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because I know who my shepherd is. I know I'm a sheep and I know who my shepherd is. And so we see it is God building his church and what the Corinthian church is doing, each and every member in the Corinthian church, by the way that they behave, is tearing the church apart. So the question of application is, are you building with God? Are you content that he's building his church? Do you rest in his work? Do you participate in the work that he is doing? Or do you hate him for it? Do you hate him and do you hate his church? Do you hate him and do you hate his people? Or do you pray? Do you submit to the leading of Christ as he is building his church? We see Paul has also said in 1 Corinthians 3, and he said this as a warning to the Corinthian Christians. Go to 1 Corinthians 3. He told them as a warning but also giving them this great truth simultaneously in that warning. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16, he tells them, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in you? That's the church, people. The church is God's temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. Does the Holy Spirit dwell here? Is the Holy Spirit amongst you? You see, if someone were to ask you, does your church have the Holy Spirit? What is your answer? Yes. Yes. We desire to be a true church of Christ and we desire for the Holy Spirit to be with us. What is the work of the Holy Spirit in your church? Where would you point to if someone were to ask you, what is the Holy Spirit doing in your church? The Holy Spirit is building us up by faith in Christ. Oh, but you guys don't have strobe lights and you don't have that music and you don't wave your hands like this and you don't do this dance. And how do we know that you have the Holy Spirit? Well, the Bible does not tell me to identify the Holy Spirit by the shaking of my hands or the singing of a particular song. I may know that the Holy Spirit is working in us because the Holy Spirit directs us somewhere. Where does the Holy Spirit direct us? To Christ Jesus, to the Good Shepherd, to His Word, to His voice. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. They listen. They don't go off doing their own thing. They know their shepherd. They know the voice of the shepherd. Verse 16 of 1 Corinthians 3. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? What does it mean for God to dwell in a certain place, brother and sister? What does it mean for God to dwell in a certain place? It means that that place is holy. It means that that place is holy. Is this a holy place? Is this a holy place? Do you feel the weight of what holiness means? Do you even have a taste of what it means to be in the presence of God in a holy assembly for God? Think for a moment what it must have been like to see the terrifying holiness of God as Isaiah saw it. In Isaiah chapter 6, I saw the Lord seated upon his throne and his robe filled the temple. The train of his robe filled the temple. That's the under part of his coat. Filled the whole temple. That's how big God is. That's how holy he is. And the angels covering their eyes. Holy, holy, holy. Woe to me, says Isaiah, for I'm undone. To come into the presence of the holy God means that we come conscious of our own sin and weakness. And of the great need and burden that we need lifted. 
That means you don't come to church with a, woohoo, I'm getting to go to church today. You come to church, I need to go to church. Because I have a burden, a weight. This whole week I've behaved so badly. I've done so many sins. I've committed this wickedness. I've not behaved like a child of God. And I need his forgiveness. And I go because he's promised. He's promised that he's seated upon a throne of grace. Hebrews 4. Verse 14 to 16. Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. Why would we cheapen it by fabricating frivolous joy? Why? Why? Why would we do this if it puts our whole soul in jeopardy? And this is the problem in the Corinthian church as well, because they were showing off their various spiritual gifts. Speaking in tongues, prophesying, no order in the church, no sense of holiness, bickering, fighting. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. There's no unity. There's no sense of reverence and fear of God. There's no sense of we are here because we have a head, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. And that's what we're here for. Not to show off what God is doing through me in the spirit by faking it. Right? A genuine work of the Holy Spirit in me, yes, is necessary. We must show that the Holy Spirit is at work in us. What does that look like? Paul tells us what it looks like. And he will tell us what it looks like in 1 Corinthians 13 when he says, I will show you a more excellent way at the end of the chapter. The more excellent way is the way of love. 1 Corinthians 13. You all know 1 Corinthians 13 describing for us what love is. And so Paul is saying you might have the spiritual gifts, you might have all of these things, but you lack the foundation you lack the love. And this is the first thing that God comes to correct in you and me. That's the first place that God wants to work in your heart. It's not to make your life better, to make you rich, to make you prosper, to give you more comfort. God wants to transform your heart. And by nature, all of us, even me, I know this. I know this is the case with you because I know it's the case with me. We resist. We resist. When God comes, He comes and He says, what's wrong in your heart? And, oh, no, 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 no. Nothing wrong in my heart. Lord, these people in church, do. how does your prayer life look? What does your prayer life look like? When you come to the Lord, oh, Lord, I've been to church and so-and-so did that. And so-and-so is doing that. Lord, help. Lord, the world out. You see? We even point away from ourselves in our prayers all the time. Lord, there is something wrong. There's something wrong. There's something wrong. I'm lost in line. But you see, that's not prayer. Because prayer is coming first in line. Lord, I need help. Lord, Lord, if you are desperate for help, right? When you have a flat tire next to the road and you phone up the AA. And they tell you, I have six other people to help. Before we can get to you, you'll have to wait three hours. What do you, you, you feel the burden of that, the stress. Why would we do this with our spiritual need? Why with, would we do this with our spiritual need and say, oh, oh, no, no, oh, no, 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 help them first. Do this first. Lord, I can't wait that long. Help me. I need it now. Give me grace. Help me. But you see, this is not the attitude of the Corinthian Christians who think of themselves more important as the others. And this attitude of thinking themselves more important, those who have thought of themselves as less important, start to feel like we're not part of this church anymore. We're not part of the body anymore. Because if the body is all about these things, then I don't belong here. It's not my place anymore. And this is what Paul is addressing as well. 
Verse 15 and 16, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. You know, if you say this gift or that gift or that gift is more important. You start to say to other people who do various other ministries and have other gifts in the church, we don't need you. What do you think God will do when he tells his own people, I have a place for you, I have a calling for you, you have a ministry, you have a place in this church, you are a member of this body, and you, by the way that you behave, tell your brother or sister, there is no place for you. Can you imagine the anger that God must have for a person who does something like that? And so when we minister in the church, when we exercise our spiritual gifts, and this is what Paul will lead us to in 1 Corinthians 13, it's for the benefit of the body. It's for the edification of the church. It's not for my own glory. It's not because of who I am. But it's because of who God called me to be, and I'm doing my work in the way of love that Christ had shown me. Look at verse 13. In one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. It's a central truth that Paul is getting to. We are one body. It is about God and his people of which I am one. There is one body of Christ. Whether you're Jew or Greek, slave or free, all were made to drink of one spirit. Whether you're a Jew or a Greek, a slave or free, all were made to drink of one spirit. We see here that as long as Christ is outside of us, as long as his work is just him dying on a cross back then and it has nothing really to do with me, as long as all of this remains outside of us, we are separated from him. We're not part of his church. We're not part of his people. As long as his work, his death on the cross is to gather us together as his people, that all things may be united to, under him. You think the whole purpose for which Christ died was to build his church. And so if we're saying that Christ died, but the church, the church is not important, or no, not the building of the church. What are we saying then? We're saying that Jesus' death means nothing. Because Jesus said, this is what I'm dying for. God sent his son into this world that whoever believes may have eternal life. Jesus said, I will build my church. I will build my church. I will gather my people. My sheep know my voice. They will come to me. God's purpose will be realized. And that's why Paul is urgent in warning the Corinthians. Like I prayed earlier. That horse in the stable who continues to kick and resist, does that hurt the person standing outside the stable? No. That horse only damages himself. That horse might break a leg and needs to be put down. Isn't this the same picture we have Paul describing to the Corinthians? You're like wild animals. And he says this in, verse, in, in chapter 11. Some of you have died and become ill. Some of you have died and become ill. I'm just trying to find the verse quickly. That's 1 Corinthians 11. Do you have the verse there, Veronica? So I saw you going there quickly. Verse 30. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 30. That is why so many of you are weak and ill and some have died. Because you're not careful with the holiness of God. Because you're not careful to understand that this is the temple of the living God by which he dwells with the Holy Spirit. Danger, danger, danger. And you see how loving Paul is then. What? How unloving it would be of a pastor. How unloving it would be for the apostle to just stand back and watch them destroy themselves. When he's called to be the one to tell them, Basop, watch out, careful. Right? 
And you see, when it comes to our physical well-being, it's easy. It's easy to shout and say to someone who's walking off a cliff, to, oh, don't, wait, basop. Oh, thank you. You see, they realized the danger they were in without realizing that they were in danger. But what happens to someone who is in spiritual danger and they don't see the spiritual danger? They're just spoiling my fun. Just spoiling my fun. And so the response that Paul might get, but he's going to risk it anyway, is that there might be some who might be angry with him for warning them. Oh, Paul, you're too serious about these things. Oh, you're too serious about the church. Oh. But you see the cruelty if he would not speak up. And so we need men who are courageous and bold to preach the word, to tell people, watch out for the holiness of God. Watch out for his wrath. Be reconciled to God. Paul says his ministry is a ministry of reconciliation. We plead with people, be reconciled to God. Don't be content with being under his wrath. Desire for him to make you one of his children. And we see then this is the work of the Holy Spirit. The primary work of the Holy Spirit then is faith. For in the one spirit we were baptized into one body, Jew or Greek, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Faith is the work of the Holy Spirit. Faith has no other source than the Holy Spirit. This is what the Holy Spirit first works in our hearts is faith. Look at John 1 verse 12 and 13. Or just write it down for those of you taking notes. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Those who believed in his name, verse 12, are those, verse 13, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, but of the will, nor of the will of man, but of God. The Holy Spirit and faith. The Holy Spirit gives faith. It's his, his primary work. The first thing he does in your heart. He's not first there to give you a spiritual gift. He gives you faith to believe. Work of the Spirit in you, the work of the Spirit in you is to believe. Faith does not come from you, in other words. The source of your faith is not from you. Faith is the work of the Holy Spirit in you. God gives this gift. Ephesians 2 and verse 8, For by, the grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. Right? This faith is not your own doing. Now you might say, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, what is the this? Is it the grace that is not of your own doing or the faith that is not of your own doing? Well, we all know that the grace is not of your own doing, right? It's logical. Why would he have to add that the grace is not of your doing? Because he's talking about the grace of God. The reason he needs to add the qualification, it is not of your own doing, because we would be tempted to think that the faith comes from us. You were saved through faith, and that is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Faith is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So that no one may boast. We then need to express this desire for God in prayer. Luke 11 verse 13, Jesus teaches his disciples when they pray, he tells them, you need to pray for the Holy Spirit. And he promises them, if you then who are evil, he tells them the parable about a father when a son asks him for bread and he says, which father will give a serpent? He says, if you as evil fathers, as earthly fathers, evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? You see, you don't come to God in prayer with faith. You come to ask for faith, even. 
That means that faith is not a requirement even for prayer. Understand very clearly what I'm saying here. We need to pray by faith. But to begin to pray is to ask for the faith necessary to carry you through the whole prayer. Understand what I'm saying. You need God through the prayer to work out faith in your heart. So prayer is an exercise in which God works faith in us. You see why we lack faith? Because we don't come in prayer to receive that faith and the gift of the Holy Spirit working out in us. You see, what do we come to do? We come to ramble off some words to God. Someone once said, you know, the word of God preaches God speaking to us and prayer is us offering something. No. The, the word of God works in your heart. The Holy Spirit uses that. The Holy Spirit uses the prayer to work in you. Prayer is not a primary work that I do to please God. It's a work that God does in me so that the Spirit's work may be evident in me. Because Romans 8 tells us, Romans 8 verse 8, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You cannot please God in the flesh. If you come to the Lord in prayer without the Holy Spirit, you're coming to Him in the flesh. And that will not please God. Why does God not hear my prayers? Because you haven't prayed for the first important person, the Holy Spirit. You haven't prayed for the necessary Holy Spirit first. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. And so, for application purposes for us, that would mean that when the Spirit is truly at work in us, and truly working this faith in us, we would be characterized by our prayer. And this is what the Corinthian church is missing also. If we take the rest of the scripture witness, what we see then is that the Corinthian church weren't praying. They weren't a praying church. They were a fighting and bickering church. And so instead of fighting and bickering, thinking of ways how to debate with others, spend your energy less on debating others and coming to prayer meetings. Pray together with God's people. Pray in your inner room. In John chapter 15 and verse 5, Jesus says this, and this is again, the, the flesh cannot please God. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is it that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown in the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. You see, Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And verse 6 gives us the warning again. If, you, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. The wrath of God remains on those outside of Christ. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my works abide in you, ask whatever you wish. You see? If you abide in me and my words abide in you. That's again. Don't tell me about the work of Christ for you if you don't show the work of Christ in you. You need to abide in him. His word abides in you. We see then Paul applying this verse 14 to 16. For the body does not consist of one member. And so he's here also guarding against thinking that unity in the body means uniformity. Oh, if only all of us were like this. If only all of us were this kind of member in the body. 
You see, that's why it's easy to do certain ministries when it's a men's ministry, a women's ministry, a youth ministry. Those things are easy. Preaching to a mixed group like this is way harder. That's why some churches even say, let the, let the kids go out and have Sunday school during a worship service. Because it's difficult for children to sit and listen to a worship service. But that's not how God intended it to be. God wants through the preaching of the word every year, whether you're five, whether you're six, whether you're 60, whether you're man, whether you're woman, whether you're Greek, whether you're Jew, to hear in the assembly of God in his church, the body does not consist of one member. The church does not just consist of people like you. The church consists of people like you, yes, but also different from you. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would it make it any less a part of the body? So, even if you are an insecure member and your insecurity leads you to, to say this, something like, I don't belong here. The truth, Paul says, is it doesn't make you any less a part of the body. So regardless if you feel like I'm not a part of this, God says you are. If you're truly a child of God, he says to you, you are. But I don't feel like I'm, you are. By salvation, you are. Because it's not about me and Jesus is about God and his people of which I am one. And so when God saves me, he has a place for me in the church already. He's made that place for me. He arranges me there. And so when he says, if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, what, that would not make it any less a part of the body. Could you just imagine if someone were to try and use a screw, screwdriver to drive in a nail on a block of wood, right? Wouldn't work. If someone were to use a hammer and try to loosen a nut, it's foolishness. Won't work. And so why would you limit God by saying only one kind of person, only one kind of ministry in the church? There is one body with many members and all are necessary for each and every function. What are the functions in our church? Well, anything that helps us to worship God on a Sunday. What does that mean? The cleaning of this building. The projection. Singing the hymns together. Passing a hymnal to another brother or sister when you see that they don't have one. Part of the ministry, right? Part of serving one another. Saying to a brother or sister, I'm praying for you. It's part of your ministry, right? And that's the most important part of the ministry. I can stand here all day preaching to you. And if that does not produce, if it does not produce the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in you to produce those things, my preaching would be meaningless, right? Right? God will accomplish his purposes through his word in his people. And so verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? The body is dependent on its various members. And God makes the various members. God has made you what you are, so be content. Right? Did I make you what you are? Did you make you what you are? You did not make yourself, right? So who are you to tell God you've made me incorrectly? As it is, verse 18, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. So you might be wondering, why has God placed me here? More specifically, why am I here at Emmaus Baptist Church? Even? Why am I sitting on one of these red chairs? Why am I here? The question is, are you a part of the body of Christ? Are you, the, are you a member of the church? Have you committed yourself to be knit together with fellow believers in this place? Have you, by the grace of God, by the grace of Christ, realized God has somehow provided in this place for me to hear the gospel here? 
and for his grace to break through even in this day through the preaching of the gospel that I may understand the nearness of the salvation of God for me today? How will I thank him? How will I live for him? And here is the other truth. And remember, Paul is writing to the Corinthian church, and he's not telling them that church is broken, go to a different church. Notice that. Notice that. How many pastors, how many pastors tell people, your church is broken, come to our church. Well, that church is... What is Paul saying here? He's standing before a congregation, a church, and he said, God arranged the members in the body, each of them, as he chose. He made the Corinthian church as he made the Corinthian church. God has made the, if Emmaus what he's made it. Yes? Emmaus would be different if you were not here. Emmaus would be different if you were not here. But we can't go around saying, well, how better Emmaus would be without so and so, without this and that. Who are we to say what God has to make this church to be? Who are we to say that? And God leads us through our conscience. Through your conscience, you think, I, I must do this, follow the Lord here. And so, brother or sister, wherever your conscience is clear before the Lord with the scripture in your hand, earnestly seeking to follow the Lord, follow him. Follow him. And do what he has convinced you of but do it with the conviction in your heart that this is from the Lord and no one else is forcing me to do this no one else is making me but I'm compelled by the grace of God and by the Holy Spirit at work in me the truth is no local church is going to live up to your standard of what you think the church should be you won't find a church like that and the moment you do you must realize it's not a church anymore it's your fan club the moment you find a church that fits with everything that you think is right, it's no longer a church, it's your fan club. Emmaus Baptist Church does not even live, live up to the standards of what any of us may think, right? We all have different prayers and thoughts. The truth is, Emmaus is not even what I would like it to be. But that's not what matters, right? Right? This is what the Lord is working in my heart week after week is to say, this church is not yours, pastor. It's the church of Christ. Be careful how you work with the church of Christ. Be careful how you lead his sheep. Because John 10 tells us, the one who enters by the door is the shepherd. And the sheep know his voice. Right? Right? The question is, because the church is not living up to my standard, the question for us is, am I going to pack up and leave? Am I going to go? Because I'm not completely comfortable with where we are at the moment. Are you going to leave because it's not comfortable? Because it's difficult? Because the relationships are a bit strained? Or what, what, what's your solution to this? Am I going to prescribe to God in the prayers and say, God, you must sort this thing out? Am I going to tell him what he must do with his church? Like I said earlier, Lord, sort them out, sort this out, sort that out. Or am I going to sit and say, Lord, I am the problem. And this goes for me too, right? After the service, I need to go and sit and say, Lord, show me. Show me what needs to change in my heart and give me the strength by your grace, to walk in your way. Am I going to do what the Lord tells me? Because you see, local churches must live under the headship of Christ. We together are responsible for living under the headship of Christ. But that also places the individual responsibility on us to walk as individuals before the Lord. Because we walk together before the Lord. And maybe the reason why there is certain strife and not walking together is because 
we might be trying to lead the church where we want it to go, where we want it to be. God leads his church. He made this church what he has made it to be. Then there are some who would say, well, you know, this local church business is just too messy. Let's just leave the local church because, you know, there's something like the universal church anyway, and, 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 and Christ is head over the universal church also. He's head over all Christians, whether you're part of the church or not. Well, I would just ask, where does the universal church meet? Where are your brothers and sisters from the universal church whom you love, you serve, you pray for, you stir up to love and good works? Where do they meet on a Sunday morning? Where do they baptize believers? Where do they have the Lord's Supper together? Tell me. Tell me how you are going to experience the grace of God while you cut yourself off from the grace of God. You can't, right? Because God, Ephesians 4 and verse 11, he gave to the church. Paul is writing to the Ephesian church and he tells the Ephesian church, he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. The building of a local church is also the work of Christ building up his church. Because it's a physical expression of the salvation we believe that we've received from Christ. Otherwise, we could just be a spiritual church, virtually, over Zoom. If that's true, I quit. If that's true, I quit. You see, I'm not a pastor because this church called me to be a pastor. It's a real truth. You're not a Christian because you were told the gospel in this church, right? I'm a Christian. I'm a pastor because Christ called me to take the responsibility. And yes, he's shown me this is the place where you take the responsibility, right? I could have gone to many other churches, but I accepted the responsibility for this one here. Why? Because Christianity must be real. And you must feel the weight of that where you are at. But if you constantly look for another place to be a better Christian there or there or there, I tell you, you have it wrong. Because you'll never be a Christian like that. Because there will always be an excuse to be a Christian in a different place. And you're blaming God. The reason I'm not a Christian is because God has not put me in the right place yet. Foolishness. Danger. Not just foolishness, danger, danger, danger. You see, all of this about the universal church and all of the Christians, and it sounds very theological, but it remains theory, theoretical. Where does it become real? Where does it become practical? You see, the whole New Testament was written, was written as epistles, as gospels to communities, to churches, to local places where believers were gathered written to the un not written to the universal church it's written to local churches yes expressing the truth of our one our unity of faith in Christ but it's also it's again it's the picture of members real flesh and blood people being knit together in local churches and real flesh and blood local churches being knit together to one another it's not theoretical local churches knit together it's not pie-in-the-sky, airy-fairy kind of stuff. God arranged. You see, that's the truth that Paul gets here. God arranged this as he chose. So the question is not where would you like to serve, you know, if we were to ask in membership classes, you know, I had to, where would you like to serve the Lord? What would you like to do? It's, a, it's an irrelevant question, right? It's an irrelevant question. What do you think you must do? Or what would you? Because it's not up to you. God arranged. God chose. It's not where would you like to. It's where. It's, not all, it's also not where would I be most comfortable. I would be much more comfortable sitting there listening to someone preach. It was nice to listen to someone else preach on Sunday last, last week. Right? But where do you think? Where do you think most of us would be if it was left up to us to choose? But you see, the question for us is not where would you like to serve, what do you think? The question is, 
where does God want me to serve? Lord, where do you want me? Lord, what do you want me to do? And be ready because the Lord answers you. When he answers you, he's not going to tell you you'll be most comfortable here. He's going to tell you this is the special place I have for you to work because it will challenge you, it will shape you, it will make you what you're not and make you better because it's my work in and through you. So don't think that God will choose a place for you where it's your strength, right? I say to many people, and they don't believe me, but I tell them, by nature, if you would want to use the terms, introvert, I'm an introvert. I don't like speaking. Ask Dashes. He's with me on a Monday. We spend two, three hours not saying a word to one another while we, we work. I don't like talking. I'd rather shut up and do something. But that's exactly, you see, the Lord has placed me here to speak. Even though I don't want to. Lord, I, you see, can't even get the words right trying to speak to you. God chooses us not where it's most comfortable for us. He chooses us for the work to show his glory. And then to end off this, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 31. Paul tells the church, earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. He's encouraging them not to, because of their misuse of the spiritual gifts, throw it all out, but saying, desire these gifts, desire these things, but I will show you a more excellent way. It's like when you're a child growing up and you, you want to have a car because of what the freedom that a car brings. But you first need to learn how to deal with it responsibly before you can have a car. Right? Ruben, it would be irresponsible for me to tell you, go and have a drive with my car. Right? It would put you in danger and everyone else. Okay? And this is the same that Paul is saying. Watch out. You've been given, yes, gifts. But there's a responsibility attached. I will show you a more excellent way. It's to exercise these gifts in love. To look at that car and say, Wow. To look at that spiritual gift and say, wow, yes, I get to do this. I'm terrified. I don't know how to shift the gears. I don't know how to, you know, but I'll learn. I'm willing. I'll do this. And why do we do this? Because the excellent way that Paul is going to show them is because of love, exercising the gifts in love. Why must we do this? Why must we exercise the gifts in, in love? Because Christ first loved us. It's the love of Christ that motivates our love for one another. You see, you don't have to go home and look at yourself and find some way to love. You know? I could never find a way to love so and so. I could never find a way to love my husband or my wife or my spouse or my children. You're, you're absolutely right because love doesn't come from you. Love does not come from you. Love comes from Christ and from God. God is love. Therefore, God sends his son so that you may receive the love of God. And so when you receive his love, you're able to give love. But you won't be able to give love if you're not received it. So if you see someone who's unloving and unkind, you know that person has not experienced the love and the kindness and the goodness of Christ. You know that. Because no one who's experienced the love, the kindness, the goodness of Christ goes around bashing other people. It doesn't mean that Christ cannot make a whip to whip the money changers. Oh, poor old money changers. You know, the love that Christ had for the people of God whom those money changers in the temple were ruining you must see that. You see, the shepherd knows who are the sheep and who are not. We must understand 
that it is the love of Christ that compels us. And so when we, when we hear this, we say to God, this is so hard. It's so hard. We, we sometimes think we can, we can never do that because it's not, it's not going to be easy. I hear many of you saying to me, Christianity is not easy. It's hard. Amen. It's hard. Jesus said it will be hard. Jesus said it will be hard. Matthew 5, Matthew 7, he said this. The gate is narrow. Matthew 7, verse 14. The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. God's mercy and his forgiveness and his love for us show us the excellent way of following God and also showing mercy and kindness and love. In your own time, go and look at Matthew 18. Look at that parable that Jesus tells his disciples when Peter asks him, Lord, how many times will I forgive my brother? How many times will I show him love? Peter says, can I stop at seven times when he sinned against me a seventh or an eighth time? Oh, Lord, when can I stop loving? When, when, when can I have a break from forgiving people? When can I have a break from, sh oh, from showing kindness? You see how wicked and evil we are. We want a break from doing good works? Really? If you take a break from good works, what happens? Your life falls apart. The life of the people around you fall apart. Because it takes active work in the Spirit and in Christ to continue to do good. And for the transforming work of the gospel to progress. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward. Keep moving forward by the grace of God. And then what does Jesus answer Peter when he says to him, you shall forgive him whenever he comes to ask you. And he tells them a parable. He says there's this master who was calling to account his servant and his servant owed him a debt he could never repay. Never. And then the master forgives him this. And then the same man goes out and he wants to choke his brother to death. And what does the master say? The master says in verse 33, should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Not look at his poor state, feel sorry for him, do this for him. It's I have done this for you and you went out and did not do the same thing for your fellow servant. So if you do this for a fellow servant, a fellow brother, a fellow sister in Christ, what you're actually saying is, that means nothing to me. God's forgiveness, his mercy to me, that, all of that means nothing to me. Because I'm unwilling to give it to someone else. If God were just like you, what would he do? Take it away from you. He would never give it in the first place. But you see, that's the contrast. God is good and you and I are not. It's not that we are so loving. It's that we are hateful. It is the love of Christ that compels us to love. God is not asking you, in other words, to do anything for him that he has not already done for you. How wonderful is that? God is not asking you as a Christian to do anything that he has not already done for you. So that the work of the Holy Spirit in you is just conforming you to the image of God. You're looking more godly, in other words. You're behaving more godly, more loving, more good, more kind, like God. So that the light of Christ shines in you as he called you. We heard this last week. Let your light shine before men. Where does the light in you come from? From the gospel of Christ. He put it in you. Let it shine. Let your light shine before men that they may glorify your Father. To end with, if the work of the Spirit is not evident in you, you nullify and deny the work of Christ for you. To accept the word of Christ for you is to embrace then the work that he is doing in you. To accept the work that he's done for you is to embrace also the work that he is doing in you. May the Lord soften our hearts. Let's pray together. Father, we've um, prayed for the past couple of weeks in our 
prayer meetings as it is also listed on our prayer items that we pray that you would soften our hearts to a renewed commitment to serve you, to forsake our own self-serving interests and to be more useful to you. Reading in the Corinthian letter that Paul wrote to them, we see ourselves therein so much and we see our proneness to be self-serving. And so we ask, our oh Lord, soften our hearts again and just like a butcher would take a hammer to beat that stake so that it may become soft and tender, so, O oh Lord, we feel the pounding of our hearts when we encounter your word softening us. But we thank you, O oh Lord, for every blow. Because we know that it is done in love, just like when a father disciplines a wayward child. Showing them some harsh and hard realities. Because the little pain that they have to endure for a little time while they're young will save them from much hardship in the future, just like you would save us from much more hardship in the future, that you would save us from that place of darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth by disciplining us and letting us go through certain unpleasant things, even as the writer of Hebrews tells us that no discipline is pleasant at the time. But as we look at your love through the discipline we thank you we praise you we worship you we thank you that when we have stopped behaving as children you continue to behave like a father to us so that we again may be your children and feel like your children and not be as orphans how many fathers who refuse to give discipline to their children, have disowned them, have cast them aside, have caused them to live as orphans. And, oh, Lord, you would not let us live as orphans, so we thank you. And so we pray, oh, Lord, as we come this morning to the Lord's table, that we would do so with great joy because of who you are. And even though our hearts may be sore, even though we may feel the weight of your discipline upon us, even this morning we pray that you would grant us the free freedom of conviction by faith to know I can eat with gladness what is said before me because God has not disowned me and that I believe with my whole heart. May you be with each and every one of us. Knit us together as a body of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.